good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Roebuck. I'm with Free Internachi, and I want to say welcome to all of our attendees this morning. Uh, we've got a few that signed in so far. I'm sure that number will rise as we open the uh, webinar up this morning, so I may have to come back in and make a few announcements a little later. But I want to say welcome to uh, uh, those inspectors advisory committee, uh, Stephen Reinhardt and Sean Emmerich that has joined us. Welcome, guys. And we're also honored this morning to have Mike Malloy, Tony Rentero, and uh, Tony Slagle join us from track. So we've got an outstanding uh, class this morning, a webinar going on this morning. A couple of announcements for you. I want to just tell you that we have some upcoming dates I want uh, uh, inspectors to remember. October the 20th of this year, we will have the InterNACHI's convention in Ontario, California. That's a three-day uh, convention in California, just outside of LA. And also just as a reminder, come January 19th through the 21st of next year, 2023, another new year, we will have our Tapri Internachi convention up in uh, Bryan College Station at the Expo Center again. So we look forward to seeing all of you there. And uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, I had a note here somewhere. What happened, Brenda took my note. Anyway, I want to just say this morning that this webinar does not provide any of our attendees with uh, TREK uh, continued education hours. Uh, the, you can use your two hours of this webinar on the InterNACHI site for your education for your certified professional inspectors required hours. All you have to do is just go in and manually post that. Okay, without any further ado, I want to go ahead and get this thing started. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, I've got a couple of questions. I don't know if this is legal or who this goes to, Tony or Mike, but it says, must the consumer notice be posted on vehicular signage such as business cards, text messages, Facebook, and all advertising? All right, let me take a look at that here. We have to take a look at the rule. I think there's a little yes and no. It's... Uh, 535. What was, what was the breakdown on it, Paul? Sorry. You said well, the, the question you said, was asked. You said signage on, on cars? On yeah. cars, any text. advertisement, Facebook, text messages, any type of media. All right. Well, the, the advertising rule, uh, can you see the, the rule right now? Yeah. On my screen? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm sharing uh, 535.221. So an advertisement is uh, defined as all <laughs> communications created or caused to be created by a licensed inspector for the purpose of inducing or attempting to induce a member of the public to use the services of the inspector, including but not limited to the following types of communications when disseminated for this purpose. And it includes inspection reports, business cards, invoices, signs, brochures, emails, internet, et cetera, et cetera. So a sign on a vehicle could be considered as advertising. So if it's considered advertising, then, then it does have to include, you know, all this information that the rule requires, which includes the name of the, the inspector or assumed business name, which actually needs to be registered with Trek. So uh, just another FYI, if you use a, a DBA, a name in business, uh, you have to notify the commission within 30 days after the inspector starts or stops using the name in business other than the name on his license. Are so, you talking about a D DBA on that, correct, Tony? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a business name. So if you have, you know, your company that, you know, ABC Inspections, and you're using that instead of your, your name, John Smith Inspector, then you have to register that DBA ABC inspections with TREC. And we have a form that you just uh, fill out and, and send into the commission. So if, uh, so for these signs, anything that, that can be interpreted as advertising, then it must contain the license number of the person, um, the name or assumed name. Um, and, uh, and that's it. I mean, with, with regards to a sign. Okay. I think I probably will answer it. Sean, uh, Shannon posted a question here. It says, and to that question about the advertisement, 
he'd like to know why the rules different between inspectors and real estate agents. In what way? Like for the adding adding the license number? Well, talking about you, you adding the consumer notice. Um, oh, so consumer protection notice doesn't have to be on your advertisements. So per the rule, it needs to be. I mean, this is for your general advertising. If you're advertising for your, for your business, consumer protection notice needs to be um, on your business website in a ready, readily noticeable place. And you can link it through either using the form that's on our website using a link, or if you want to save it on to your own web server, you make sure that it needs to be regularly updated if we do update the form. And we did actually update the consumer protection notice recently. Okay. So there is differences if you want to have it written out fully on the on your homepage or readily noticeable page. Um, you write it totally out as basically say Texas Real Estate Commission Consumer Protection Notice in at least 10 point font. Or if you want to shorten it, you put Trek Consumer Protection Notice needs to be in 12 point font. I don't get a ruler out. More things <laughs> when I look at it. Um, I want compliance for it. So if it's on there in a readily noticeable place, I don't, um, you know, I don't really necessarily measure between the 10 and the 12 font font. But, uh, well, I think clarification came across in the Q&A about the license number. Why do inspectors have to put their license number and realtors don't? I think. It's always been that way, as far as I know, since I've, since I've been working at Trek for the past 12 years. So, um, do uh, I, I believe realtors have to put it on their communications, don't they? No? They, don't have to, they don't have to put their, their, their license number. Okay. Um, I think that the big difference maybe it would have been because um, <laughs> a lot of agents, I mean, if it's a sales agent, you're sponsored by a broker. So then you have that extra level where you're actually putting your broker's name on your, your advertisement. So that's, that's an extra level where you can identify a person and who they're associated with. Or for inspectors, you have a license number and a name or a DBA. So there's two ways to identify the person that's doing the advertising. So truly, I don't know the reason why. Yeah. The, the, the advertising rules for inspectors are much more, you know, simpler than for brokers and sales agents. Uh, the advertising rules for brokers and sales agents can get quite complicated. And you got to remember, they, they arise out of two different committees. There's a, there's a, the inspector committee deals with inspector issues. So as all these rules develop, you know, the committee looks at you know, needs, they look at, you know, ways to protect the consumer. And so they look at, at issues that are going on when recommending changes to the rules. And that the same thing happens with the broker lawyer committee uh, when they're, you know, looking at changes to the rules or SOP committee for on the, on the broker side. So there's different considerations when deciding what, you know, how to change the rule. It depends on issues that are going on. So they're really two separate areas. Uh, we don't we don't try to you know look at let's make them consistent because there's really different concerns, different issues with each side. And just and one clarification: um, if you if you put an advertisement on your vehicle, you have to put your license on there, but it's not a requirement like TDA on their structural pest control service, where you have to <clears throat> you have to have your license on the vehicle regardless if there's an advertisement or not, we don't, we're not required to put our license on there unless we're advertising. Correct, yeah. Good point. Okay, just for all the attendees, uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask this group, just put it in the Q&A box and we'll get, get around to your question just as, as soon as we can on it. I had another couple of questions that were sent in to me. Uh, are there any changes or updates coming to the SOP and report form in the very near future? I'm sorry, I I, I can't see the uh, the questions on my chat. I'm trying to uh, find this, it. This, this, no, was this, this was sent in to me beforehand. All right, can you repeat it, please? It says, are there any changes or updates coming to the SOP or report form in the near future? 
there, well, we are considering the inspector committee is considering some changes uh, to the SOPs. Uh, that's kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, Sean, do you want to address I, that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any major changes, but there could be some housekeeping items that that are addressed. Um, I know that we were we had a lot of discussion in the last meeting about some different items, but I don't. I mean, we just went through a major overhaul. I don't think the report. <clears throat> form itself is going to be changed. Um, there just might be clarification on check marks um, and stuff like that. I don't think there's any major changes coming to you, Tony. Slavery. No, Sean. I, yeah, let me just follow up on that. What what the SOP committee is going to subcommittee is going to be looking at currently is just clarifying some of the issues. Um, there there have been some questions about some of the changes as sean said we just did a major overhaul of well not major but an overhaal of the sops and and changed yeah. some things and did add some stuff that are that are you know significantly different than what inspectors have been doing in the past and uh and there's been some questions arising from that and so the sop uh subcommittee is going to be looking at those uh to determine if there needs to be any clarification and if not just uh, figuring out the best way to communicate to inspectors what's to be expected from it. So I would say that um, in terms of any major changes to either, that's, uh, yeah, that's, it's, a, as you know, Paul, um, it's a disruption to inspectors and whenever you do that, I mean, we have to do it, we have to keep updated, but it's a big deal when you change a form and you change the SOPs and it takes a while for people to get up to speed on that stuff. And doing that, doing changes, big changes, too frequently just ends up being a mess. So we'll, we'll the committee is going to look at things to clarify and see if there are any housekeeping things. But I would say that in terms of any major issues, um, I don't I don't foresee anything yeah. on the on the horizon. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Tony. It, it puts us all in a terrible spin when changes come because of software development, all the report forms, getting everybody on the same page. Yeah, it's a nightmare to change it. So it's it's a big deal. Okay, good. Thank you. I don't speaking have of, speaking of soft, software, one thing real quick, Paul, uh, I had uh, communications with a software provider recently about this Trek logo, um, and you can remove that logo. We talked about that, I don't know, last year at some point, where this logo can be removed and changed out with the business logo of the inspector. Right, you're talking at the top of the report form. Yes, right? sir. On that, what's on shown on the screen right now, the Trek logo. So I had a, a, a software provider reach out to me because they felt like this was supposed to be permanently here, <laughs> and we had some it, conversations about that. It's in the rule. I think we specifically uh, added that <coughs> that right. uh, permission to to remove it and add the inspector's logo to it. Right. Yeah. And, well, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tony. And, and just to just to let everybody know, whenever there's changes to the SOPs, it, it's a long process uh, that looks at you know everything comprehensively, and uh, and people get uh, significant notice. So even when the the committee decides to change a the rule, there's usually a period where you know the 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 uh, changes have been. Uh, have been uh, approved, but they're not effective for several months. So there is some time for you know software companies to implement these changes. So it doesn't happen you know right away. Correct. And you guys always give us time to comment from the field and uh, review those things too. So it, yeah, it's it's quite a process. We appreciate all of y'all's effort because it, that is a big ordeal to go through. Well, Paul, if, I, if I can add just one thing, just it, just to emphasize to the people on the phone, it's vitally important for you guys to be involved in any process. So, you know, when we're going through, when the inspector committee is going through some, some changes like that, you know, we need feedback from people because um, once the rules in place and, and people start saying this doesn't work, it's it's not that it can't be changed, but it makes things significantly more difficult. If we could get feedback up front, which we encourage, I mean, we're we're happy that this webinar is going on because this is the kind of stuff we need to encourage communication between the agency and, and the industry. But um, really your involvement as early as possible helps all of us make good policy. So just wanted to say that. Yeah, good point, Tony, appreciate that. All right, uh, Tony, why don't you, you got your report form online here. 
can you kind of walk us through and hit the highlights or tell us if there have been any issues with the inspector filling out these this this report? Yeah, yeah, we have uh, some uh, comments prepared. Um, uh, I think Mike was going to start it start us off. Mike, you want to just hit some some points? Yeah, Mark. Tony's going to go into details. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the enforcement division itself. I mean, just remind people, you know, we're a consumer protection agency. Um, it's important that, you know, if there is a violation observed out there, you see something, you report and file a complaint. I know it's not the easiest process, um, but, you know, inspectors can file complaints. Anyone, you know, any consumer can file complaints and stuff. Um, when you run into situations where you may, um, you know, get involved in a complaint or a complaint being filed against you. My best advice is, you know, for most people is just cooperate. I mean, we're just trying to do our investigation and um, we try to be very, you know, fair and balanced in regards to our, you know, if we do see a violation in regards to our punishments that we need to give. Um, I We prescribed a kind of a progressive type of disciplinary action. So it starts up smaller than may build if you get subsequent uh, complaints filed against you. So, um, and often these days, if there is formal disciplinary action, I believe education can offset some of those things. So that's why a lot of times, I know a lot of the inspectors review these orders, They'll, you'll see education as a function of, of, of the agreed order. Um, so hopefully, that will prevent any kind of further, you know, gives it some of bolstering your education. And, you know, we hopefully won't see you ever again. Um, <laughs> when it comes statistically, um, overall of our, all of our license holders, less than 1% of people ever get a complaint filed against them. Um, and, and often cases, only about you know 20% of that ever revolves into like some sort of formal disciplinary action. So most cases, uh, a lot of license holders are doing a great job. Um, they're doing what they need to do to protect the public in the you know the and how they represent themselves with their license. So, uh, but like in any industry, there's there's bad eggs and we need to weed them out and or at least set them on the right track. So um, I'm, I think it's kind of most of my opening remarks. Um, like we know, we went through a whole standards of practice review. Um, you know, Sean and Steven and everyone on the committee was deeply involved in that. I remember going through all the, it was all virtual back like all last year. So there was a lot of virtual meetings. And I think that what we have now is, it, going to help the consumer a whole lot. So a lot of times when we get complaints, it's after the fact. So we may not be able to hit on hot topics today on what we're seeing right now, because when, since the SOPs only went effective in February, it's usually several months later when we finally see some complaints that may affect these new, new, new standards and rules. But um, the last time we did do a form change, we did see a rise of people that were using the old form. I'm hoping it's going to be less this time because um, the 7 6 really goes well with um, the new SOPs. And I think a lot more people are using, you know, programs, and hopefully those 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 programmers are have already updated the forms and stuff. So if not, if you see one out there, um, I recommend the, the minimum calling up that that the inspector and saying, hey, you're using the wrong form um, and giving them a chance to change it. Because um, that's usually one of those things where uh, you're at least going to get minimally fined uh, $100 for using the wrong form. So, yeah. Mike, is, is there any, can you say there's a top three issues that come across complaints all the time or anything common? Uh, we always have questions about you know, advertising. We don't really get a whole lot of advertising uh, complaints. Um, we do get questions about the advertising rule a lot. Um, 
for for several years there, yeah, the when we went from seven dash three to seven dash four to seven dash five, in a fairly quick uh, matter, we had you know quite a bit of complaints for that. I don't really say like there's a like for that outside of that, it's usually hits on like the big ticket items where I would say like um, the roof, the structure and stuff, because that's where like a lot of the, you know, if something's missed or they, you know, or even if it was pointed out to them properly in the inspection report, um, that's just like big, you know, money dollar things for, for consumers. So they, they may file complaints on that more frequently, but. We've done studies over the years of trying to find like a top 10 and it's it's kind of all over the place, to be honest, so. Yeah, I noticed that I've seen the, the reports come out. It varies on who the complaints even come from, buyers, sellers, or inspectors or, or whoever, you know, track themselves. So uh, it, yeah, it's I, I can understand that. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Tony Renteria talk about the report form and some changes and stuff, so. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so Mike uh, was touching on, you know, some of the, some of the uh, enforcement actions that, that we have, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later on. I just wanted to point out that uh, the rule for the standard inspection report form is rule 535.223, which should you should be able to see on your screen. So I would encourage everybody to uh, to review it, read it. You know, you'll be able to see what kind of changes you can make to the form. A lot of you use a, uh, a software. Now make sure that you know the standard report form is is provided along with whatever version of uh, uh, of software uh, that you're using, because some software companies will have the actual form, and then you'll be able to, you know, uh, to input information, and then it comes out just like it would on our form. But other uh, other types of software look nothing like our form, and it's a totally different format. You can use it as a supplement. But then you, you need to make sure that you use our standard inspection report form when you're providing that information to, to the client. So in any event, you can look on, on uh, this rule and get an idea of the changes you can make to the form, you know, what uh, type of inspections uh, need to use the form. There's some exem exemptions to the use of the form uh, for certain situations. Uh, for example, reinspections uh, performed for the same client, inspections performed for or required by a lender or governmental agency, inspections for which a federal or state law requires use of a different form. Of course, uh, quality control inspections for new homes or phase inspections, they use a different form. It's, it's more of a code inspection at that point. So only when you get to the point where the building is substantially complete that you need to use the standard report form. Uh, so let me let me jump into the form itself, and then we can take a look at uh, at uh, some of the new elements of the the new form. So the first part is called the preamble. Uh, so the preamble, uh, you know, it states that this is the responsibility of the inspector. Uh, that uh, basically to comply with the standards of practice. And a couple of things that the inspector is required to do is to use this property inspection report form for an inspection. Uh, now we talked about why as explained in rule 535.223, and you have to inspect only those components and conditions that are present, visible and accessible at the time of the inspection. Uh, the, the, you know, what is accessible is defined in rule 535.227. And uh, accessible means in the reasonable judgment of the inspector being capable of being approached, entered, or viewed without hazard to the inspector, having to climb over obstacles, moving furnishes, furnishings or large, heavy, or fragile objects, 
uh, using specialized equipment or procedures, disassembling items other than covers or panels intended to be removed for inspection, damaging property, permanent construction or building finish, or using a ladder for portions of the inspection other than the roof or attic space. And I point this out because a lot of inspectors, you know, they don't inspect a system or component and they just say it wasn't accessible. So when we look at it, was it accessible or not? We look at the definition of accessible. So we look to see if one of these situations uh, was involved. So I suggest you, you know, you do that as well. Um, and uh, the next portion indicate whether each item was inspected, not inspected, or not present. Now, uh, you know, some education materials will tell you to to um, uh, check the boxes that apply. Uh, when, in, when checking inspected or not inspected, you know, uh, checking both boxes is kind of contradictory. Either you, ins you inspected it or you didn't inspect it, uh, but you can't really do both. Uh, the way it works out is if you inspect uh, a portion of it and you can inspect uh, another portion of it for whatever reason, you have to explain what the limitations were to your inspection. So you have to make sure you include it in your report. If you don't put it in there, we don't know about it. Uh, keep in mind that if a complaint is filed, we will be reviewing that inspection report. So if you're not inspecting a, a system or component, you know, you have to take a look at the departure provision in 535.227. Uh, let me just briefly touch on that. So that would be subsection um, F, the departure, uh, is this large enough? Can you see this? Yes. All right. So the departure provision. So if there is a, <clears throat> if there's a system or component that, you know, falls under these situations, you can depart. Uh, anything that limits your inspection, make sure you write it down because we understand that you know something may not be accessible, you have to explain why it wasn't accessible, um, because that's usually the dispute, is that the the, the buyer uh, will find out an issue that wasn't on the inspection report, and they'll file a complaint against the inspector, and the inspector will say, well, it wasn't accessible, but if he doesn't write it on the report, how is the you know the buyer, the client, supposed to know that it wasn't accessible? And then for us to be able to know that the departure was appropriate, they need to put you know, the reasons why it wasn't accessible. And then we will look at this departure provision uh, to see you know, the inspector may depart from the inspection of a system or component only if, only if the inspector and client agree that the item is not to be inspected, if the inspector is not qualified to inspect the item, if in the reasonable judgment of the inspector, the inspector determines that conditions exist that prevent the inspection of an item, conditions or materials are hazardous to the health or safety of the inspector, or the actions of the inspector may cause damage to the property, or if the item is a common element on a multifamily development and is not in physical contact with the unit being inspected, such as a foundation or another part of the building uh, or a part of the foundation under another unit, so you have to make sure that you look at these and you address these in your report uh, so that we know if a complaint is filed, basically you document your proper compliance with the departure. So there's gonna be situations, I'm gonna get into that later on as well. <clears throat> if an inspector departs from the inspection of a component or a system required by the standards of practice, the inspector has to Notify the client at the earliest practical opportunity that the co component system will not be inspected. And you have to make an appropriate notation on the inspector, uh, inspection report form stating the reason the component system was not inspected. So make sure you always put it in there. Now, the, the other situation that arises is sometimes inspectors <clears throat> don't inspect a system or component like the roof, for example. They know they're not going to inspect it. They're not going to get on the roof. So if they know ahead of time, obviously, you know, I'd say most houses have a roof. So if they know they're not going to inspect the roof, then if the inspector routinely departs from inspection of a system or component required by the standards of practice, 
and the inspector has reason to believe that the property being inspected includes that system or component, the inspector uh, should not perform the inspection of uh, the property until the inspector notifies the client or the prospective client that the component or system will not be inspected. So in that situation, you have to make sure you let your client know. And, you know, obviously the client at that point can maybe choose a different inspector, but uh, the rules require you to let the client know if there's a system or component that you routinely depart from inspecting. All right. So looking at the form again, uh, the inspector has to indicate an item as deficient uh, if a condition exists that adversely and materially affects the performance of a system or component or constitutes a hazard of life, limb, or property as specified by the SOPs. And that just goes along with the definition um, in 535.227. Um, the next one, explain the inspector's findings in the corresponding section of the body of the report form. Now, this is important um, because, you know, the, the we've see, we see a lot of reports where the inspector might uh, mention, you know, the systems or components that are deficient, but they don't explain. They don't provide an explanation. So this is, this is uh, it's required. You have to explain your findings in the body of the inspection report. So try to explain that. Um, now, a couple of things you want to keep in mind is that uh, you can explain each deficiency, but you can also provide additional information, comments, and recommendations. So, I mean, that's permitted because you're representing the interests of your client. And sometimes in performing your inspection, you're gonna find you know, different things and you let your client know about these things that you find and you, you know, you're trying to provide a good service. So you provide information, comments, and recommendation. Uh, the other thing that happens is that, you know, in doing so, sometimes the inspectors will go above and beyond uh, the, the, what is required by the standards of practice. And they'll provide a higher level of inspection performance. Well, going back to the rule, 535.22784 states that these standards of practice uh, do not prohibit an inspector from providing a higher level of inspection performance than required by these standards of practice or from inspecting components or system in addition to those listed under the standards of practice. But if an inspector provides services beyond the scope required by these standards of practice, including the use of specialist equipment or inspects components or systems in addition to those listed under the standards of practice, the inspector must possess the competency required to do so. So if you go above and beyond, you must do so competently. All right, keep that in mind. So Tony, would, would you, could this be applicable for like the sewage scope camera and the drones? Yes, yes. We don't require you to do that. Uh, but if you do, you have to do so competently, correct? So let me ask a question, Tony. Maybe you or your mic can answer it. Uh, <clears throat> say you have an inspector uses drone, but he does, he puts it on a report that he inspected the roof using a drone. But if he's not licensed to use that drone, would that be a violation for track? Uh, we don't we don't enforce FAA regulations, so we would not uh, be enforcing that aspect of it. We would still look at what we have jurisdiction over is whether the inspector followed our standards of practice. So we still require that the inspector perform the inspection of the roof competently. So then we would look at the facts and circumstances surrounding that particular inspection. You know, because we don't know, you know, what what he might have missed. Uh, maybe had he walked the roof, he might have seen that, you know, he might have felt that some of the, uh, there was some, uh, some give on, on, on some of the boards. You know, he might have found something that you can only do when walking the roof or inspecting it from the surface of the roof. So there's things, you know, you have to get in close proximity and I'm gonna talk about that as well to the systems or components. 
So we would have to look at the evidence, you know, what the, the buyer found after the purchase, and then determine if they met uh, and comply with the standards of practice. So yeah, so just because they don't have a license, obviously, you know, when looking at competence, we would look whether the inspector, you know, what kind of competence does he have? Did he take a class and using a specialized equipment so that they, they were using it uh, competently? You know, we would look at partially of that, but really we would look at whether the inspection was performed competently or whether they missed something they should have caught. Uh, and, you know, and that's why we don't have a drone as a, you know, that's not required to use a drone, but some inspectors may do it as, as you know, a matter of convenience or, you know, but, uh, but we will look at all the evidence before determining whether there's a violation or not. I had another question sent in to me, Tony, concerning the roof, that uh, some of the builders now are requiring that the inspectors use a rope and harness type system or have two people, one to hold the ladder when they climb on the roof based on OSHA standards. Uh, again, is OSHA something that uh, Trek, it's outside of your rules and we have nothing to do with it for Trek? Yeah, that's correct. Those are not rules that we have jurisdiction to enforce. So they may, they may uh, you know, depending on the situation, they may be in violation of some other, you know, state or federal rule or local rule. And that, that particular agency that enforces those rules may take action against the inspector if it falls under their jurisdiction. But we would only be limited to looking at our rules when enforcing any type of wrongful conduct or violation. Okay. All right, good, thank you. All right, so moving forward. Um, so, a uh, couple of tips uh, when writing the inspection report, uh, keep in mind who your audience is. All right, so uh, make sure that you write in a clear, concise manner that is not confusing to the client. You have to remember that the client is generally going to be a lay person who may not fully understand technical terminology. When writing your report, you should also consider that if a complaint is filed against you, the commission is going to be looking at your inspection report to ensure that you comply with the minimum standards of practice. So when you know writing your report, make sure that you document compliance. Uh, frequently, uh, we get inspectors who you know they get a complaint against them, and you know we look um, to see what the report says, and sure enough, they missed uh, a certain deficiency that was present and visible and they didn't put it in the report. So when they respond to the complaint, they'll tell us that, hey, you know what? I did inform the client verbally. So, but unfortunately, if it's not in the report, you have not complied with the centers of practice. So make sure that if there's a deficiency that you put it in there, put it in your report, you document it. That's a way to show that you complied because we do look at the report uh, and everything in, in that you put in the report to, uh, to look at whether you complied or not. So one, one of the questions, yeah. if I can interrupt you. Sure. Uh, it was asked when it says corresponding sections, does this mean that a wall defect must go under the wall subsection or that it just needs to be in the structural se section? It said, I uh, asked this because I saw another report last week that the inspector listed all defects for each main section under the other subsection. Uh, well, it, it's, uh, you have to list, uh, I, I'm kind of jumping ahead. I was going to touch on that a little later. Um, but, uh, you have to list, um, in the appropriate section. You're right. They, they, uh, let me take a look at it here. All right. So. Um, so let, let me give you an example. All right, there's, um, you have to put down um, whatever deficiency is in the area that's applicable. 
Uh, on occasion, you may need to put it in more than one section. For example, um, when you get to inspecting the, the foundation. All right, so I'm gonna jump, jump ahead a little bit here. All right, so let me talk about the foundation. Uh, foundation inspections are probably the most, or they're, they're the, perhaps the most problematic for inspectors. Uh, you know, here the inspector is required to give an opinion of performance, as we all know. Uh, when giving the opinion of performance, you know, the inspector needs to tell the client whether the foundation is performing as intended or, or not. And, you know, certainly it's kind of tricky because, you know, most all structures tend to move slightly. And, you know, we got to keep in mind that a residential foundation is expected to remain reasonably flat and level to provide acceptable performance. So the inspector has to evaluate and take into consideration, you know, the structural performance and the integrity and uh, determine whether it's performing as intended. If it's not, uh, then they'll notice uh, there's a negative effect uh, on the structural integrity of the building. So the way you see this is by, uh, by looking at visible and present indicators of adverse performance. So, uh, and that goes to, to the question is uh, when looking at, at, for example, you know, there's, there's uh, you can see, you know, doors that are, you know, binding out of square, non-latching. So what some inspectors do, they report that in the door section. They see framing or freeze board separations. They report that in the exterior section. They see sloping floors, they're reported in the floor section. They see, you know, issues with the windows, walls, floor, ceiling, cracks, and separations. And they'll report it in the, you know, the, the appropriate section. Uh, cracking, deflecting masonry, cladding, you know, again, in the exterior section. But then they don't, they don't, uh, they don't report it in the foundation section. And when you look at, uh, 535.228, and then you'll see that subsection A1C, it says that the inspector shall uh, generally report present and visible indications used to render the opinion of adverse performance. So generally report. So that means that you know, in, in the foundation section, they have to generally report some of these things that they've already put in the, in, the, uh, in the other sections, but they have to do it with relation to the foundation section because these are indicators of adverse performance to the foundation. Even though it's not like a crack on the foundation, we all know that, you know, it, it relates to their opinion of adverse performance. So in those type of situations, they should uh, they should uh, report it in the you know corresponding section, but also make a reference in the foundation section. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, I believe I believe I did. I believe you addressed it quite well. <clears throat> so I had a one in the chat box. Let me see what they're asking. Uh, it's going to jump jump around a little bit, Tony. I apologize for that, but it says which section should tub shower tile deficiency and water damage under the sinks go? I believe that's going to probably be a, a multiple section, just like the foundation, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean it depends on what what is being affected. Yes, I think if it applies to more than one uh, section, you know, it may impact you know, different, uh, yeah, different sections. You're right. If it's yeah. applicable. If it's leak, if there's a leak and it's affecting the wall ceilings and there's a leak. So you report the leak in the drain section, the damage to the wall and the wall section and the damage to the ceiling and the ceiling section. So it'd be right. three, three sections. And, and, uh, just a, uh, tip or pointer 
that I wanted to mention. This is something that I had uh, that I've ran into uh, more than one occasion. Is uh, just want to remind the inspectors when you're inspecting a a uh, shower or a or a tub. You know, I've had situations where the inspector will turn on the water and then walk away and, you know, inspect other sections of the home and let the shower running. And they do it, you know, just to see if there's a leak or, you know, maybe they want to fill out the, uh, the, uh, the, the shower section to see if there's, you know, if it leaks at the bottom uh, or the tub, they want to test, uh, it, you know, that it, that it, uh, that it drains properly, et cetera. But they, you know, they let it run and they walk away. Well, I've had cases where, you know, one time the tub wasn't, the drain wasn't connected. So they turned it on and they walked away. It was a second level uh, tub and it caused all this damage to, you know, the floor, the, like Sean was saying, the ceiling, it was thousands of dollars. And had the inspector been there, he would have caught the leak right away as soon as it got onto the floor, but he walked away. And, you know, I've seen that happen with showers as well. They let it run and then the water just keeps, keeps running through, you know, whatever um, deficiency. Sometimes the homes are, are vacant, so nobody's lived in them in a while. And, and the, maybe the, the, uh, the leak had not manifested to that degree, but it deteriorated. So when the inspector inspects that system or component, it's gotten to the point where once they do that, it's going to cause a lot of damage. So just one tip, because th this could be catastrophic, you know, not just for the inspector, for the homeowner as well. Um, you know, if you do that, kind of keep an eye on that. Don't just walk away because water can cause a lot of damage. Real quick. <laughs> yeah so anyway so you want me to keep going yeah keep going yeah I, we just had a few questions pop up i'm getting some in the chat and some in the q a all right well i was just going to talk about writing the inspection report um section 1102301 of the license act states that an inspector may not perform a real estate inspection in a negligent or incompetent manner so competency, you got to remember, also extends to the preparation of the inspection report. Uh, the inspection reports, section 535.222, requires that you prepare a report noting observed deficiencies and other items required to be reported. Uh, we talked about the definition of a deficiency uh, is defined as in the reasonable judgment of the inspector, a condition that adversely and materially affects the performance of a system or component or constitutes a hazard to life, limb, or property as specified by these standards of practice. There can be general deficiencies, which can include inoperability and material distress, water penetration, damage, deterioration, missing components, and unsuitable installation. So the, ins the inspector is required to explain the findings and the corresponding uh, body of the inspection report like we just explained. We kind of jumped ahead a little bit on that one. Uh, uh, the, the preamble on the report does explain uh, to the client that, uh, that if any item or, or uh, comment is unclear, they should uh, contact the inspector to clarify their findings. Um, this is important for the inspector to respond to questions from the client in a timely manner. Uh, because what I've seen happen sometimes is that the inspector is busy doing some other stuff, you know, working. They may not respond to, to the client's questions, and that frequently leads to the client getting upset for whatever issue and filing a complaint. And then, then instead of, you know, being able to avoid a complaint with a simple phone call in a timely manner, now they have to answer to us because there's a complaint investigation against them. So I'd say, you know, keep a good uh, line of communication with your clients. Yeah, and I love that part where you have the responsibility to the clients. That paragraph is awesome. Because a lot of times the clients do not follow up on it. Then they'll call the inspector and say, well, if you had told me about this and the inspector opens a report and says, well, I did tell you, recommended a plumber or air conditioning contractor, you didn't follow up. 
So, I mean, that's, that's a good, good comment to have for inspectors. Thank you. That, that is a good comment. And also for us, because, you know, we understand the, if the inspector does their job and tells the client what they need to know and what they need to hear, then it's on the client to, you know, do their own due diligence and, you know, get an additional uh, uh, evaluation, a further evaluation, you know, and if they don't do it, you know, that was, that's at their discretion that they failed to do it. And it's good that it's actually in here. Uh, we amended that a little bit. That's something that changed. It was a little bit more, uh, there was more verbiage to it before and we clarified it a little bit, but it's still in there. So, um, all right. I also wanna talk about uh, the, the explanations that the client, uh, I'm sorry, that the inspector provides to the client. Uh, there's a section for comments um, and comments may be provided by the inspector, whether or not an item is deemed deficient. So certainly you have to report deficiencies, but again, you're providing a service to the client. If you wanna provide you know, comments, uh, additional information, recommendations, you can do so whether or not an item is deemed deficient. So the rules don't specifically address the format in which deficiencies, comments, and recommendations should be delivered. So the reported deficiencies should be clearly discernible to a lay person, like we talked about before. You know, try not to use uh, technical terms. If you do use te technical terms, make sure that, that you make it understandable for the client. You know, the other thing you wanna avoid when writing your report is to write in sort of a stream of consciousness narrative form where I've seen reports where an inspector just kind of goes off, you know, checks the box deficient and then just goes off on a stream of consciousness about, you know, what happened in, in that particular section. And, you know, even for me that I, you know, I've read hundreds of inspection reports, you know, I had trouble uh, trying to decipher what was the deficiency, you know, what was, the, what's, what's the comment what are the recommendations? What's the information? Because everything was so mixed in that there was no way for the, the, the client to say, okay, this is what's wrong with, with uh, you know, this particular section. So kind of be, be aware of that when you're writing your report, you wanna write it competently, you're providing a service to the client, you, know, you want them to make a good decision based on the information you're providing them. So, so, uh, so although you're allowed to provide additional information, such as comments uh, regarding applicable code, you should make it clear that this is not a code inspection. So if you ever make comments about that, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, if you do that, you know, you should make it clear that you're not reporting this as a deficiency, unless it is a deficiency. Sometimes it is a code violation and a deficiency. Uh, because if, if you do that sometimes you get complaints from the seller um that you know they get upset that you reported a deficiency that wasn't a deficiency but that's another matter uh when writing your report uh you should consider that a comment or recommendation that is mixed in general narrative uh could be misinterpreted as a deficiency so to avoid confusion um you should simply use additional subheadings. So rule 223, the standard inspection report form 3H um, allows the inspector to add subheadings under items provided uh, that the, provided that the numbering of the standard items remains consistent with the standard form. So, all right, so let's go back to the inspection report and then go back to the, some of these big ticket items that we find. Um, and we talked about, you know, the two most frequent types of complaints are probably gonna be the foundation and the roof. These are major ticket items. And, you know, the, some tips to avoid a complaint on these sections is, uh, you know, number one, um, it, you are required to give an opinion of performance. All right, we already talked a little bit about that. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the, um, 
indicators of adverse performance. Uh, but, you know, the other thing I see is that, you know, it's helpful for the inspector and it's helpful for the client. Uh, but I do see that some of the newer inspectors, uh, they, they kind of follow a checklist. You know, they look, they look at the foundation itself and they, you know, they kind of check off what they see on the foundation. And, and uh, you know, it takes a little while to gain the knowledge and experience to understand uh, the movement of the foundation and to learn to identify more subtle indications that there might be a problem with the foundation. Uh, and and uh, sometimes, you know, an inspector that's just following a checklist, they, they might give an opinion of performance, uh, but they might fail to see the big picture, what's going on with the property, with the house. Uh, what I've noticed, uh, I, I, you know, I, I kind of think about this particular case that I had where this inspector was, was uh, very, very competent when I spoke with him about his inspection report, he was very knowledgeable about the foundation, you know, and he, it was almost like an art form. Over the years, he could see a property and he could see uh, what's going on with the movement, you know, and, uh, you know, the, what, I, what I saw with this inspector, he didn't go and just, you know, do a checklist of things. He kind of looked at he looked at adjacent properties, you know, he looked at the grading and drainage. He seemed to visualize, you know, the flow of the water, the land, and he could see how, you know, maybe the property would slide down a hill, you know, all those things. Um, he would look at the slope of the property. Uh, he could see the, the, you know, the movement of the entire home. Uh, he understood the significance of certain cracks in certain locations. And, and, and then he could tell that there was a problem. He could, you know, I remember in this particular home, he, he told me that the, the, the property was kind of twisting. And as it was twisting, it was causing, you know, these different uh, failures. And, uh, you know, I just thought that, that uh, this particular inspector was very, very, uh, very competent in his foundation inspections. And, you know, granted foundation inspections are difficult. So they, they, you do have to be extra careful with those. Uh, and again, I would highlight the fact that you should always pay attention to these indicators of adverse performance. You wanna put them in the foundation section to you know, generally report like the rule says, but also because the client needs to be made aware that the inspector has identified possible indications of adverse performance. And this also, this information allows the client to make an educated decision whether to accept or reject the home in its present condition or whether to obtain a further evaluation. Um, any, any questions, Paul? No, not, not at this stage. I don't see anything popped up. All right. Yeah, so the explanation, Tony. Thank you. Sure. So the other, the other component that, uh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. I forgot to mute my phone. There. So another uh, another area where we have problems is uh, you know the crawl space. Uh, the crawl space uh, we do get um, some major complaints about the crawl space, and you know I want to highlight something that we got to remember is that Rule five thirty five point two two seven. Uh, subsection C, uh, general requirements says the inspector shall uh, visually inspect accessible systems or components from near proximity to the systems and components and from the interior of the attic and crawl spaces. I mean, that that is not in the foundation section, it's in the uh, general 227 section, but it specifically uh, talks about inspecting visually uh, accessible systems from near proximity to the systems or components and from the interior of the attic specifically and crawl spaces. So this is problematic because uh, many inspectors, you know, 
there's a there's a crawl space you know they poke their head in the crawl space they look around everything looks good and that's it you know and they just or some of them go in a little bit but they don't go far enough to inspect the beams joists the bridging blocking piers posts pilings column sills and subfloor from close proximity which is what the rule requires you to do and you got to remember, most crawl spaces uh, are going to be a high moisture environment, and the wood beams uh, can rot uh, over time. So when you're looking at a beam from a distance, you might not be able to tell that the beam is rotted. Uh, so you need to get close to the, you know, the particular component, and you need to examine that component and or probe the wood to test to make sure that it still maintains structural integrity. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, we've had some cases. Uh, I know Steve, uh, I've asked for his uh, expertise on a particular case with, you know, some issues. And, uh, you know, in that particular case, the, you know, the beam would crumble. You, you would grab it and it would just crumble up. Uh, and, you know, my understanding is that you can certainly, you know, there's different ways to tap on it. Uh, you can poke at it with a screwdriver, with a, with, a, um, you can just probe it and see if it's been, uh, if it's rotting, sometimes you get, you know, termite damage that affects it. But again, if you're looking at it from a distance, you may not be able to tell that there's a problem. And of course, you know, the, the, uh, client after the purchase finds out that, that there's problems with the foundation. Again, this could be catastrophic, several thousand dollars, and they're gonna file a complaint plan against the inspector. And you know, rotting doesn't happen overnight. So if, if this is discovered shortly after the inspection, then uh, the inspector might be on the hook for this one. So, um, all right, any questions on that? No, no, you're doing good, Tony. Everybody seems to be following, following with your comments there, so very good. All right, so the other, the other thing I uh, wanted to touch on is uh, the roof. I guess we talked about the roof a little bit. So the same kind of thing applies to the roof. You know, you have to inspect uh, the roof from close proximity, the, the uh, roofing components. Um, so the rule, specifically talks about roof covering materials that the inspector shall inspect the roof covering materials from the surface of the roof. Okay, that's, that's what the rule states. However, uh, many inspectors have gotten into the habit of regularly using binoculars to inspect the roof instead of walking the roof. All right, and you know, there's some provisions that allow the inspector to depart, but some inspectors are not really following the departure provisions that we talked about earlier. You know, they just, uh, they just think that this is an appropriate way of, of inspecting a roof the same way that you know, could apply to a, a drone inspection. You know, they're, they're, you know, we would have to look at the evidence, but uh, again, are they inspecting it from the surface of the roof? Well, if you're on the, on the ground using binoculars, you know, you're actually not on the surface of the, of, of the roof at that point. Um, so uh, are they able to depart properly? You know, we would look at Again, the departure provisions, um, actually section 535.228C2 <clears throat> uh, says that the inspector is not required to inspect the roof from the roof level if in the inspector's reasonable judgment, and again, it has to be reasonable. You can't just give any reason. It has to be a reasonable uh, reason. If the inspector's uh, reasonable judgment, the inspector cannot safely reach or stay on the roof or significant damage to the roof covering materials may result from walking on the roof. Sometimes, you know, some of these roofs may be tile roofs 
and walking on the roof might actually, you know, break the tile, crack it. Um, so they got to they got to give a reason. But uh, so on those situations, then they're not required to inspect the roof from the roof level. You know, but uh, what I've seen is some inspectors, you know, they're just using binoculars from the ground on a on a, uh, you know, well, there's nothing particular about or hazardous about the roof. I've seen them use it on a single story, which is pretty flat, you know, not steep at all. So there's nothing unusual about that. They should be inspecting it from the surface of the roof. Keep in mind that that uh, you can miss things. If you don't get on the surface of the roof, if you don't get close to the systems or components, you're going to miss things. Uh, and, you know, what I've seen is some inspectors, when I've talked to them, they tell me, you know, I walk the surface of the roof because by walking it, they can see if there's some, you know, spongy wood that just gives in too much. Then you know that there's, there might be some water damage. You know, you can also inspect it from close proximity in the attic. So once you're in the attic, that's another section you, you know, you want to particularly focus on this section where it seems that there might be an issue. So it just helps to provide a better, a, a better service to the client and avoids complaints for the inspector to just do, do that. Uh, but uh, again, the inspector is allowed to depart. So looking at the departure provision in 227, and it's worth, it's worth repeating. If you do depart, Make sure you follow the departure provision requirements. So uh, looking at the roof, for example, we gave that as an example before. You can depart only if you know, the inspector and client agree that the item's not to be inspected. That way the client knows ahead of time, hey, I know you didn't inspect the roof. I may have it inspected by, by uh, a roofing uh, expert if the inspector is not qualified to inspect an item. So there might be a particular, you know, maybe an optional, well, an optional doesn't have to be inspected. Something that the inspector is not qualified, you know, that could be, that could be a reason. And, or if the, in the reasonable judgment of the inspector, the inspector determines that conditions exist that prevent the inspection of an item, conditions or materials are hazards to the health or safety of the inspector, or that actions of the inspector may cause damage to the property. So that's consistent with what's in the rule in 228. So it is consistent. They just have to document it. All right. So again, if the inspector departs from the inspection of a system or component, the inspector shall notify the client at the earliest practical opportunity that the system or component will not be inspected and make an appropriate notation in the inspection report stating the reason or the component or system was not inspected. You can't just come back after the fact, after the complaint has been filed and, and say, oh, you know, I, I didn't write it in there, but I told my client verbally. Because at that point, the client is going to say, he never told me. I didn't hear it. And what do we have as evidence is the inspection report and we don't see it on there. So that one is, is uh, the inspector is required by the rule. So make sure you, you uh, document, document, document. And then so, finally, go ahead. Uh, a question popped up on that same subject. Says so: if a drone's being used to inspect a roof from the roof surface, does someone always who uses a drone need to inform every client that the roof inspection will be conducted using a drone? Well, it's not from the surface of the roof, um, and they are inspecting it, so they're not departing. I think the the, the, the issue there is whether it's being inspected from the surface of the roof. Now, a drone is not required. That's, that's a specialized equipment. It's not required. There's some issues with competency. Uh, so I think that would be more of a competency issue. So if, they, if an inspector chooses to, to do a drone inspection, um, they're not really departing. Um, they're not really departing. From the inspection of a system or component, it just goes to the to the uh, how well they're conducting their inspection. You know, certainly they're they're going to do a visual inspection on it. They're not walking the roof, 
So just keep in mind that if you do that kind of inspection, you know, there might be some issues that might be present and visible uh, on there that the drone may not, may not fully disclose. You may be able to find those issues by looking in the attic. So you have to, if you're gonna do that, I would suggest then do a better job or more thorough job when inspecting the attic so that you can try to see some, you know, uh, evidence of water penetration, some uh, wood damage, you know, some some damage where there might be some, you know, possible entry points for for vermin, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, but I, but I, no, I, that's I, not a departure. Hey, Tony, uh, I, I think they would be departing if it was a one story roof and they didn't walk the surface and they used a drone. And if they used if they if they never walked a one story roof uh, and they would only use a drone, I think they would need to use a routinely depart from or if just one house they use decide to use a drone for a one story roof, then they would have to depart from it on site. And I, I would add that I think that regardless, it's a best practice to let your client know if you're using a drone. I mean, I just think that 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 makes sense that if you're going to do that route regularly, you ought to let your client know that so you, you stop yeah. any issues from happening in the future anyway. But I, I think I'd agree with Sean that I think it's, uh, you know, inspect from the surface of the roof has implications that you, you've got to be if you're not walking the roof, there's there's a, there's a need to let your client know that. So. I mean, I, I agree that uh i mean there, there's a reason why we say that it has to, you have to walk the roof yeah. and let me look at that rule again the 220 228 so we really need a walking robot drone right yeah well, well it would be the same almost as if you like you know if you if you never went to crawl spaces uh, foundation crawl spaces but you sit one of those little buggies in there the robot the cars that people are using now you would be yeah. departing from going entering the crawl space and you would have to notify your client and, and yeah paul there's not anything prohibiting any of that use of technology right. it's just notifying letting your client know up front so that they're they're able to make the decision they may be fine with that especially if you're if you're doing an adequate job or or you're doing the right kind of inspection but you know, I, I would say that you just, it's all about communication with your client and what the expectations are. Um, and, and, uh, and if you're, if you're using technology and you don't think that there's any, and there is not necessarily anything wrong with it, then there's no reason why you can't disclose that to your client and shouldn't be disclosing. You should be disclosing it to your client ahead of time. Yeah. Communication is the best key for all of us. Yeah. But I, I agree that, that, uh, you know, that's the best practice. The, the, the language that I see, it doesn't, it doesn't say to walk the roof. It says the inspector shall inspect the roof covering materials from the surface of the roof. So arguably, arguably a drone is, you know, at the surface of the roof. That would be the argument that they would make. But then, you know, then the, this one here, I think we probably need to clarify this. Um, that... Uh, you know, because these don't apply, you know, there's no issue. Uh, maybe there is an issue in a situation where the inspector cannot safely reach or stay on the roof, then that would be covered if they use a drone, you know, or if significant damage to the roof materials may occur, then, you know, then that would be an alternative where they're not required to do so. Okay. So, um, so the, yeah, I think maybe this might need some clarification. Uh, inspecting from the surface of the roof, it doesn't say they have to walk the roof, but certainly it, I think it should. It, it's better to walk the roof for the reason I, I stated. You can find certain issues by walking the roof that you would miss if you don't walk it. So, all right, so let's keep moving on. Uh, Paul, any questions? I see something just popped up. Uh, let's see, no, no, it wasn't related to that. So, no, it, yes, we're doing good on it, Tony. It's uh, good questions, and I know the roof's always something that comes up in our classes or as we're teaching the standards of practice. And uh, so, I'm glad glad you're answering that, so that everybody could hear that from you guys. 
Yeah, and and you know the we we're technology is developing. We we're still we're still uh, trying to uh, adapt to different things that pop up as as the profession uh, progresses. Um, you know, some inspectors are using specialized equipment. Again, we would look at competency uh, at that point. Uh, some of the some of the you know the 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 typical inspection is still we still consider it the way it's been done for for many many years uh, but we are starting to consider like smart homes things like that so those have been part of the conversation in the sops and we are we are you know adapting to those things but obviously there there's things coming that we may need to take a look at in the future um you know for for future clarification but uh we did have a couple of questions pop up, Tony. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, one said, can we handle notification via the agreement about not accessing the roof? And it says, I set expectations on roofs and crawl spaces with what I consider reasonable and safe access. So can you, uh, in the agreement he sends out saying that we don't climb roofs, would that be acceptable? I think, I think, um, it's hard to to give a an opinion without looking at the circumstances. Um, so I think um, looking at something more specific, you know, I think it's best for the inspector and the client to communicate. Certainly, you can give a notice via you know the documentation that you're providing to the client because that would be notice. But remember, it, it it does say that it's an agreement. So if you have an agreement, you know, to whatever, whatever they agree, it's an agreement. So we just need to know how it's worded to make sure that the client receives sufficient notice. Uh, because, you know, the client may not even know that this system or component is part of his property because they, you know, they're the buyer. They don't know they're buying the property. They might not know. So I think it, the the inspector should be more proactive and letting them know that, hey, your house has this system or component and I'm departing from it. You know, that would be a little more clear because uh, again, the problem is that if it's not clear and the client thinks like, hey, he didn't inspect it, you know, they're gonna get a complaint. Maybe they did comply with giving notice, but the, the client didn't understand it clear enough where they had to file a complaint. So I'd say uh, it's, it's certainly a way to provide notice, but it just depends what the notice uh, actually is. A general notice would not be as good as a particular notice about this particular pop property. Paul, can I add to that? The, the rule actually yes. says you can't do an inspection if you routinely depart and you don't let your client know ahead of time. I would say that putting it in an inspection agreement doesn't really follow the spirit of that. You need to notify your client ahead of time. Because, and the reason that was put in there is for that same, is that exact purpose. So the client at the end of the day, it hasn't signed something that, you know, people sign stuff all the time. I'm not saying that's an okay thing to do without reading, but they do. And there's no, no reason for them to then come back to the inspector and say, you didn't inform. This is to protect both inspector and the client, give the client the option to, to um, choose another inspector if they want that component inspected, but also to, so the, ins the inspector is actually letting them know in advance that, hey, I do this. So on the back end of things, there's not any issues with that. So um, I, I don't disagree with Tony in the sense that that's a form of, of communicating that, but it doesn't really follow the spirit of what the intent of the rule, which is you let your client know in order for them to have the ability to choose whether or not they want to use your services. It's okay if you routinely depart, but you just need to be transparent about it. Yeah, good point. Yeah, communication is the biggest thing on any of this stuff to keep the class expectations and what they expect and what we do as inspectors sometimes, sometimes just doesn't juke and jive. So communication is a key there. Okay, another comment before we kick back off, I think this is to uh, Tony and Tara again. It says, in my area, most roofs are greater than six and 12 pitch, which I no longer walk. I use a ladder against the eaves to view, camera on a pole and binoculars. I put this in my inspection agreement and also verbally advise my clients, does this meet the departure clause? Sound like we may have just addressed that. Yeah, I think I think we, we addressed that. Uh, that would be a routine departure. 
and providing uh, providing uh, notice of routine departure, then the client would have the option of you know saying, well, I don't want this kind of inspection. I want you know someone to walk the roof because they, there is a routine routine departure uh, given uh, before they engage the inspector. Uh, it's uh, I mean I would have to look at uh, we look at the complaints you know, at the time they're filed, we look at the evidence at that time. But uh, it certainly sounds like the, the inspector is doing uh, his best to notify the client specifically of what, uh, what can be done and what the departure would be and it, that it is a routine. So it's a routine departure. Uh, I'd say probably, probably complies. I think the key is to make sure it's in advance. Again, you just need to make sure that the person knows, because if you're telling them after the fact, then you've, you're not complying because it says you can't do the inspection if you don't notify them in advance. So if he's doing all that in advance of the inspection and, the, and he's getting some sort of understanding from the client, I, I think Tony's right about that. It just depends on what it is. I mean, we don't know. We, uh, we'd have to see how, the, how this is handled. But yeah. All right, good. That's all the questions now. Go for it, guys. We're waiting on y'all. All right. Well, you know, we had uh, some of these questions actually address some of the things I, I wanted to talk about. Um, we um, are there any questions about any other systems or components? Um, you know, uh, Steve, Steve, would you would you give a little bit of a, an explanation on the crawl space uh, testing out, you know, some of the wood? Because I know you and I talked about that when the inspector gets in the crawl space. Uh, I think that's important to mention, but I think it's best coming from an inspector, an experienced inspector, how that should be done. I, I remember some of the discussion we had was the technique of probing. Uh, some inspectors absolutely say they don't probe because then they cause damage to the finish. And I guess that's location dependent. If I was outside on a nice finish of a house, and I'm trying to drive an awl or a screwdriver into wood frame windows to see if they're damaged, I might cause damage. But if I'm under a house, I don't think probing with an awl or some tool like that and maybe leaving evidence that somebody's touched it with a tool is an issue because your main purpose is under there is, is looking for structural integrity. And it's not always visible unless you reach out and touch it. And that's kind of the problem of doing the crawl space inspection from the scuttle hole itself, which sometimes is, is size, you know, maybe a size issue and you can't fit. I see them where, you know, they're half the size of this computer monitor and I can put my head and one arm and that's it. Uh, then the best they're going to get is, you know, one of these. 5,000 loom flashlights and a long lens camera and taking good pictures and, and advising them that I was uh, limited on what I can see. But if you have access to get under there and it's safe, now there's, there's another one kind of like roofs of what is considered safe for you or for me or for Sean is a moving target. Uh, and it varies with age and experience. Some guys, I've, I've been stuck under them and had to empty my pockets and stuff to get under them. So accessible for me changed about 20 years ago. Uh, but, and, and also the environment. It typically looks like the basement of the Adams family house underneath there and you're worried about critters and stuff like that. So access or, or safety is, is a, a big concern. But getting under there, and if you can't, or if you don't, because it's, it's you know, murky, there's water, there's mud, there's critters everywhere. Uh, you stop for a second and you realize I hear sounds and I'm not the only one under there. It's going to limit what you do. Uh, and, but you need to advise them. You know, I didn't go to the far reaches. Uh, you know, typically most of us will train, at least get to the wet areas. You know, try to, because that's more than likely what you're going to find, where you're going to find damage is under anything that produces moisture, bathrooms, kitchen, mechanical equipment, 
that's where you find most of the water. You don't find a lot of water damage, you know, in under bedrooms. Uh, you might find them around the perimeter. So you want to look at those areas. If you don't, just say you don't and why. Anytime you don't, if you don't put a limitation, it's assumed that you did the full way, just like we talked about roofs. If you don't say you didn't inspect part of the roof, it's assuming you walked all the edges all the way around. You check the flashings, you check the adhesion, the fasteners. Uh, you're checking all those things. Now, Steve, uh, with the point that you're making is, is uh, I mean, I agree. You have to uh, put down all the limitations to your inspection. Uh, but looking at that scenario you're describing where, you know, you run into, you know, you're, you're doing your inspection. You get to a portion of it where it's there's water there, you know, so you, you mentioned there's a there's a limitation. I couldn't inspect that. So the, the based on your experience, uh, you, you would probably recommend a further evaluation because if there's damage, I mean, there's, if there's moisture, there's probably likelihood there, there might be some moisture damage, which you then well, make a recommendation. Yeah. Well, and I'm not a big person to make recommendations unless it's not obvious. You know, if, if the air conditioner is not working, I don't need to make a recommendation. I think to get an HVAC technician to come look at it. It's kind of obvious it's deficient. It's not working. If I see something that's kind of vague that I'm not sure if it works, I might say that this, you know, is somehow kind of worded. I just, I personally try to avoid having a report full of recommendations that it, it wanted implies that we didn't do a whole lot. I'm just recommending electrician, plumber, and mechanical guy look at everything in the house. And I'm like, well, what was I there for? But under the house, uh, areas like that, if I see, like is anywhere I see something I don't understand I don't uh, know what's going on or I uh, yeah I see water standing water under one of the bathrooms my first thought is I got a leak so I'm probably going to have I'm going to have a comment that I see standing water under there uh, I'm also going to have probably push a comment up into the plumbing section that uh, there's a leak I typically, we rarely do we do inspections where we're really by ourselves completely because uh, I'll have somebody go up and run the water in the bathroom. Then I sit down there and look at them. Uh, but if you're by yourself, you know, there's some guys and I've done it before. I turn on the water in the, in the bathtub and the sink and then I run downstairs and I go into the crawl space and I look for those things. If, if I've seen an indication of water leaking, if it's completely dry, and I've already done all the bathrooms, which I do first before I go in the crawl space and look for water, then there's no reason to do that. But yeah, anytime you don't do or don't touch all of the things that it says in the SOP that you're supposed to be checking for, then there's, you know, you're, you're probably exposing yourself to some issues. Uh, and if you don't put any comments, it's assumed that you did all the things in that section and you didn't find any of the need to report as a defect or a deficiency item. Uh, it does, you know, not, not that you didn't go to the other side. We've seen that where, you know, somebody didn't write any deficiencies, but they also didn't go all the way into the crawl space. And uh, that's where you're leaving yourself under trouble. All right. Thank you, Steve. So, uh, Let's see, I do see a question here, Paul. Um, somebody saying, uh, I don't think you can damage rotten or deteriorated wood, even if it has fresh caulk, bondo, or paint over it. So the way we, the way we look at it is uh, if, you know, the, the wood is already rotted out and the inspector is, uh, is, you know, testing it, it has happened where, you know, like a window uh, there's a, there's a, uh, molding that's been freshly painted, but, you know, it looks kind of suspicious. So the inspector goes to, you know, to test it, uh, because, you know, they have the experience where hey, it looks suspicious. They just freshly painted this. It looks a little weird and they go to test it and the screwdriver goes right through because there's no structural integrity. And then that portion of the wood just falls apart. And we get a complaint from the homeowner saying, oh, the inspector damaged 
my property, look at this window, it just fell apart, or look, look what he did. And they show a picture of the wood that it's, you know, looks like it's been destroyed. But uh, I agree with that comment. Uh, the inspector can't destroy or damage uh, uh, this particular component because it was already damaged. He's just, uh, he's just discovering the damage and reporting the damage. So, so in that type of situation, we would not fault the inspector for noting that the wood was already damaged by his actions. His actions were not unreasonable. Uh, under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, just just a reminder for those of you that are online with us, if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A mm -hmm. box so we can answer your questions, try to follow up on it. Uh, to get you off the subject for just a minute, Tony, just to change the course for a minute, you can go back to it. But I had a question that was sent to me. It says, should home inspectors do inspections and get paid at closing? You know, um, do the inspection, but they don't get paid until it goes to closing. We, we well, I get the question a bunch across the state, so I'd like to, you guys to address Yeah. That. Well, uh, the rule that was recently uh, amended is uh, 535-222 inspection reports. So, and that's something we're looking at right now. But it says, for each inspection, the inspector shall prepare a written inspection report noting the observed deficiencies and other items required to be reported and, and deliver the report to the client within two days, a receipt of payment for the inspection unless otherwise agreed in writing by the client. So, so the, those are the two issues we would look at um, if a complaint is filed against the inspector. We don't say that they can't do it, but you see the problem. Uh, there could be problems um, if uh, you know there's no agreement. Um, if you know, is there payment? No payment. You know, at, at some point, the the inspector has to make sure that they don't injure the the client's interests. Uh, so I don't think we we specifically exclude that that agreement so if they agree the inspector agrees with the client that uh you know i will deliver the i will deliver the report to you now and you know shortly after the inspection and you will pay me uh, at closing you know then that would be contemplated here on the unless otherwise agreed in writing so we would look at the circumstances uh, Mike, do you have a different opinion? Tony? Yeah, I, I just want to, and I'll let Mike go first if he wants to, but I was just going to comment on something on a discussion that happened at the inspector committee on this very topic. Oh, I was just going to talk about that. So you can, you can, you can take it. Well, it was brought up um, that there might be a possible uh, issue with um, with tying it to the closing um, and whether or not that's ethically okay, if there's some perceived uh, understanding that the report is going to be, um, you know, written in a way to benefit the, you know, the client and not actually be accurate. Um, I will say that um, at that meeting, it was discussed that this is a contractual issue that's difficult for Trek to weigh in on. In other words, if the, if the inspector and the client agree on this, it's not really in violation. The, the, what the rule states, as Tony mentioned, was you have to provide the report two days uh, after payment. We are looking at trying to amend that to allow, um, uh, to be clear, I should say not allow, because it's currently allowed, but be cl to clarify that an inspector can, uh, can get paid ahead of time and schedule it for later. Um, so that there's not any perceived uh, issues with that. Um, that's something we're looking at. We're going to bring back to the committee uh, at the July meeting to, to look at. But um, it, it, it gets tricky, Paul, because it's, it is a contractual issue in terms of that agreement. I know there's, some, there's a company out there that reimburses the inspector at the time of the inspection, and then they get reimbursed at the time of closing. So but that's, there's no issue there. They're getting paid. That shouldn't be a problem. 
the real question is whether or not there's some ethical issue. Again, I think that's that's a um, that's something we need to look at. But I don't know, uh, as we talked about at that meeting, if that's something in terms of getting involved in the contractual uh, agreements between a client and an inspector, if that's something Trek uh, really has jurisdiction or should be getting into. Yeah, yeah the, I think the biggest issue that I, that I saw on that was the ethical standpoint. You know, will the inspector write an easy report, let's call it, so that he will get paid at closing? That, that's the biggest thing. I mean, if we're you know, really wanting to protect that consumer, are we counting all inspectors as being ethical? Uh, and, you know, I want to say yes, but, you know, it's, we live in a real world. So, you know, it's, that's just a question. So I, I don't know how to address it either. That's why well, I'm it, 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 it's part of an ongoing discussion right now. I don't know if in terms of that particular item, if we'll have any real um, closure on that. Uh, hopefully we'll have some clarification, but we are looking at that because that is an issue we do have jurisdiction over if there's some sort of ethical um, coercion going on. But, um, you know, outside of just having the the, uh, the inspector agrees to get paid at the closing, uh, you know, that on its surface uh, is not anything I think we would get involved with. Yeah, and I, I have the rule pulled up uh, where that concern is addressed by rule 535.220 b3 so the inspector should conduct the inspector's business in a manner that will assure the client of the inspector's independence from outside influence and interest that might compromise the inspector's ability to render a fair and impartial opinion regarding any inspection performed so you know so if the inspector does write this report in a way that is not fair and impartial um and it does it in a way to make it easier to close so that he gets paid, then the situation changes because there is some uh, ethical violation there that we do have jurisdiction. So if we have the evidence to prove that somehow the inspector manipulated the, the veracity of the, the, the factors in his opinion to conform his opinion to make it you know, less, less deficiencies so that he could close, uh, to get paid, you know, obviously, if we have the evidence that we we would have jurisdiction over that because that's just wrongful conduct. I mean, overall, you, I mean, I think best practice is get your money up front because a, not all deals go through, and you know, just just say you know it's just, you know five hundred dollars and that's you know a fair amount of money, but going through the small claims process of attempting to collect it and all that stuff. It's, you know, do you really want to do that as a cost of doing business and stuff as well? So, I mean, we can't prevent something like this, like, you know, both Tony say, you know, outside of the um, ethics component, but I wouldn't, I, would, I mean, if I was in the practice, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have that kind of agreement. The client. So, so Mike, Mike makes a good point, and just to let everybody know, this, this, uh, this section here for the inspection report, that was an addition to an old version of the, the rule, 222. So in the past, this wasn't on here. Uh, the, it, was, it was deliver the report to the client, I think it was within three days. Yeah. So this section was not there. So they had to deliver the report in a timely manner, obviously, because that was in the best interest of the client. But then we did get into a situation where a lot of inspectors were complaining because they would enter into this kind of an agreement to get paid at closing. They would deliver the report. They would get paid, a, uh, supposed to get paid at closing, but then the transaction fails and nobody gets paid at closing. So they don't get paid. Now they have to sue the client to get paid. So, uh, so we added this um, to allow some flexibility to, you know, to the inspectors that if they don't get paid by the client, then there's no requirement to deliver the report. So they, you know, or, or you know, if they have an agreement or if they get paid, they have to deliver the, re the report within two days uh, if they get paid or have an agreement. But that's what the issue is that, um, that a lot, of, a lot of inspectors were not getting paid. Uh, some of them did some areas, my understanding is some areas, that's the way they do business in that particular area, or that's the way they expect the, the inspector to do business. But some of these inspectors did not like that because 
you know, who wants to do an inspection and not get paid? Yeah. So that would be an issue. And, and again, we amended the rule. And now we're looking at, at this issue again from that other perspective, the ethical uh, perspective. So uh, I don't know where we're going to go with that. It, it just depends. Yeah, you're right, Tony. That is, uh, I've gotten this out of West Texas mostly, where they, if the realtors, they, they won't use the inspector if they don't build a closing. And that's, you know, forcing a lot of the inspectors, particularly the new ones to come in and say, well, I guess everybody's doing it. So I guess we'll have to do it. And they're finding out that, hey, sometimes they don't close. So sometimes they don't get paid. So yeah, it is an issue that, yeah, I don't know how, how to actually address that other than from our standpoint as an inspector association, we're trying to educate them to get paid at the time of the inspection or before. But, you know, different areas are going to dictate to them how they get to business. Paul, can I ask you a, a clarifying question on that? Yes. Who's requiring it at closing? Is it the, is it the, the client is it the is it the title company like how who's who's requiring the inspector to get paid at closing it's the agents the realtors okay so that i mean that may be we've done this before we've done sort of a two-pronged approach at educating our license holders about stuff so that may be something we need to look at if there is any any sense of coercion on that part you know maybe we go we also go back to the brokers and the real estate agents and explain to them what their obligations are and there may not be a violation there i think it needs to be some looking into but i just i i want to make sure that inspectors um who are in that position are do not feel compelled to write the report a certain way do you know what i mean okay good all right, let's see. Let's see if I have another question before we go on it. Uh, said I've never had the realtor determine when the client pays me. Well, some of some some in the, some areas they do. So it varies from area to areas. Now Houston is not not quite dictated that way, but I know in some of the other smaller areas they are. Okay, that's all the questions I've got right now, guys. Thank you all for answering these things for us. We really appreciate your time and effort. We've got about 15 minutes left. So if anyone else has Q and A's to put up or please post them while we've got the opportunity to ask uh, the track staff and uh, inspectors advisory committee that's been here and been so kind to come and answer these questions, uh, please post them. We'll try to get to them. All right, we're back to who, which one of you guys want to take it? Uh, well, I think uh, we probably, you know, there's only so much we can uh, talk about the 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 uh, form. Um, uh, probably, if anybody has questions about a particular system or component, the 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 issue is that that the standards of practice just changed in February, so you know it hasn't. We haven't had enough time to see. Uh, enough complaints on some of these uh, changes. So we don't have any uh, feedback at this point regarding particular changes. Um, you know, there, there have been some changes to uh, the, the electrical, uh, but I think probably uh, maybe Sean might be better qualified to discuss specific changes to the SOPs. Uh, with regards to the to the inspection report, I think we pretty much exhausted the changes. We want you know we want people to to uh, comply to understand how the reporting uh, affects you know their their potential of getting a complaint. So we want to make it better for them to provide the information to the client. And just again a reminder that that uh, you know your client relies on the information you provide in the inspection report. So try to be clear uh, on how you communicate that and be responsive. I see Steve has uh, his hand up. Yeah, I just, I had kept some notes of a couple things we talked about on the way and they're kind of the same questions uh, that some of us have seen. Uh, the question about the number of boxes you can check on a report. Because our report combines areas, you know, doors, you got inside, outside doors, you got exhaust fans and heaters together, uh, cooktop, stove. There is a potential to really have 
and I, and what I think maybe all four check boxes because you're referencing different things, which means you have to have some explanations. Say with say with doors, I'm going to inspect all the interior doors. Some of the doors are missing. Is that a defect or not inspected? And most of us would say if a door is not installed, I'm going to maybe check. I didn't inspect that door because it wasn't here. I may have doors that have damage to them and they're they're as a checkbox for defects. I may have doors in an occupied home that I can't get to. Uh, not that it's a hoarder house, but it's got full of full of stuff piled up. So I have doors I could inspect. I have doors I couldn't inspect because of personal items. I have doors that are damaged and I have doors removed. And you find that scenario in a few places where you might potentially, and, and, and the caveat is you explain every one of them. You know, the, the doors that are not there, I didn't inspect. They're maybe in the garage. I obviously can't see them. I have damaged doors. I have doors I can't get to. And I always put pictures of, of all of those, or you know, a picture of the door jam with no door, a picture of a damaged door, a picture of a door that I can only see the top two feet because there's stuff piled up on it. And you might find the th same thing in cooktops and ovens, you know, who's gotten to an oven and it's full of stuff. That's where they store all the Tupperware and all the stuff. So I'm not gonna check the oven. Uh, cooktop works, maybe one burner's out. Uh, or the oven's removed. So there's there's some places potential where you can get a lot of boxes. I say if you don't, if if you only are checking inspected and there's no comments, it's understood that you checked everything in that section. If you check any other box, it's going to have a comment, you know, whether it's a defect, not present, or uh, it's limited because you couldn't get to it. You would have otherwise inspected it. Um, and I think that kind of brings into the, the departure. There's so much confusion about the departure. Uh, I mean, there's many reasons. In, anytime you are not inspecting something that's in place in the house, then it's a departure of some kind. Uh, if it's because of access, it's a 12 and 12 pitch roof, that's a no brainer. I mean, it's not accessible because it's, I mean, it's not inspected on the roof because it is, it is too steep, you know? So you just say how you inspected it. Roof, I mean, ladder, binoculars, that's okay. If it's something that could be inspected, you know, if you pull 10 inspectors and nine of them say no problem, and I think we alluded in the discussion of a three and 12 or four and 12 pitch one story house, inspectors not inspecting it. And he's sending a drone up. I, you know, there's no way to inspect the adhesion and fasteners and things like that. You know, there's a place for a drone. I've got three of them right under the desk here. Um, and it's the high roofs, deep roofs, things like that. But I also put in there, I did not walk the roof. I could not verify adhesion, fasteners, things like that. But again, the drone is a tool like an infrared or something that assists you and it's better than nothing. A drone is a lot better than binoculars from across the street. So you may depart because it's unsafe. You may depart uh, because of safety. You, you, know, you may depart just because you don't do that. Now, if you get into that category where you just don't do roofs at all, that's one of those upfront disclosures. If you get to the house and it otherwise looked like a good metal roof, but it's got a good coating of dew on it or a little drizzle and it's not safe. That's one that just as soon as practicable, you let the client know uh, that's not, you know, but if, if it's a steep one and you never do roofs, and I've seen that guys just say, I'm too old to do roofs. I don't do roofs anymore. That's one of those you need to tell them up front. So there's a few different levels of departure that will dictate whether or not you tell them in advance or you tell them on site, but you always explain why you didn't do it. And that's, that's kind of confusing there because sometimes you'll get on Zillow, like a lot of us, and look at the house and you look in the description, they got a ground source heat pump. I don't know anything about ground source heat pumps. I mean, I do, but some people don't. They know that in advance. So they know in advance, 
they may be able to check the performance, but really anything else. So that would be maybe something that you would tell them. I don't, you know, I'm not, uh, that would be a departure because you're not trained on it. And we're finding more and more of those in smart homes and uh, complicated things. You know, you get into a pool and it's all automated, controlled on the web. You don't know that till you get there. But as soon as you find out, it's like, I can't do this. I'll hit the button, refund your money and try to find somebody who knows how to do that. So you, you find a varying level of departures, whether it's unsafe, you don't do them, whether you know in advance, whether you got there. And as long as you explain uh, and you're not one of the I never do's, I think there's not going to be a problem there. Um, I think that's those two things, the check boxes, I get a lot of questions on departures. Uh, again, there's some things you can use as tools to help on areas you had to depart because it's not safe or access, inaccessible. That's all I had, I think, on my notes. All right, good. Yeah, uh, I, I just take a few notes down too while we're going over stuff. And, and some of it's not really, you know, just exactly with the uh, report template, but, uh, you know, we there have been some inspectors that recently were disciplined about uh, getting on roofs and getting in crawl spaces. So just uh, guys, just uh, make sure you're reviewing the SOPs and seeing what the expectations are for those as far as headroom clearances and everything like that. And then like Steve was talking about just going into your departures, if you, you know, aren't routinely not getting in crawl spaces and you get to one you can't get into, then um, at least have a conversation with your client, make sure you put that in the inspection report. Um, and I think there's gonna be some clarification on the drone stuff. We talked a lot about that while we were revising the SOPs. Um, and we, you know, there was a kind of a, task that was assigned to us to determine if we wanted to tackle every specialty item out there, sewer line cameras, drones, infrared cameras, on and on and on. And we decided rather than create an SOP for each one of those items that we would just revise our general provisions where we talked about competency, like Tony talked about earlier, that if you're gonna use some of those specialty items, which a lot of us do, and you need to be able to demonstrate competency, uh, if there's a license available for that, or if there's training that provides some kind of certification for that, then those would all be good ways to demonstrate the track. If there was ever a complaint generated, um, that you did have competency in those areas. So, um, and then I know Tony brought up about the, uh, Renter Ear brought up about the uh, overflowing tubs and stuff like that. Um, you know, I kind of just took a note about that as far as Clarifying that um, if you're testing a, a plumbing fixture and it leaks, you know, not by any fault of your own, um, then the, you know, the damage underneath there would just be reported. If you overflow a tub, um, then that definitely would be something that was uh, your, your error and would put most likely be writing a check or some insurance claim coming from yours. So. Uh, I've had tubs, I've had jacuzzi tubs that were never connected by the builder uh, on a third, third floor townhome. And when I went to test it, it flooded the entire house. Um, obviously that was nothing I could see in advance. And as soon as I noticed the leak, I stopped it. But, um, you know, those can get, we can get, inspectors can get in situations where damage is caused by testing. Um, and it just would be something you need to clarify in the report um, how the event occurred and everything. And then the, the other thing uh, that came up in the inspectors meeting uh, is the walk and talk that has nothing to do with the SOPs, but I just thought this would be a good platform since there's a lot of inspectors on here and doing walk and talks uh, are becoming a hot topic these days. Um, like Tony covered earlier, if it's involved in a real estate transaction and it's substantially complete, we need to be following the SOPs. If we're not gonna follow them, we have to depart and we need to be using the inspection report that we covered in this meeting. So uh, walk and talks in the state of Texas for a real estate and tra transaction are not allowed. So that's, that's all the notes I really had. 
Good, Scott. That was on my notes, too. It was in fixing to come up. Tony, yeah. Scott, I have a question directly for you. When will the, or how can people get a hold of the little SOP booklets? Well, uh, thank you uh, for asking about that, Paul. We uh, shipped out about 1,700 of those. Um, last time we did a, 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 the first time we did a version of that and, and did it, we, there was not that big of a demand for it. So there's a little bit of a cost associated with that. So what, what we were really trying to do is encourage people to use the online version that I think Steve has talked about as being very useful. We are going to, so we're, we're, we're out of the pocket edition. What we're going to do, and I, and I want to stress this because I know the last time we did this, it was a mess. We're going to, we've got a communications director on staff now who knows her way around publications. We're going to provide a version of it online that you guys can print out on your own that will not be the mess that the last one was where you have to cut it and do all that other stuff. So we're not, we're no longer going to be producing the, uh, the pocket edition um, I believe the order form is off the website, but we do encourage you to use the online version, which again um, is, you know, you pull it up on your phone and look at it. It's not, it's not an app, but it's, it's, it's fairly, I think, and I'll let Steve talk about it if he wants to, fairly easy to use. And then hopefully in the next week or so, we'll have a version that you can print out on your own. It'll be big, a little bit bigger than the, um, than the pocket version, but you won't have to cut it or do any of the other stuff that the last version requires you to do. So I hope that answers your question, Paul. Yes, it does, Tom. Thank you so much. Uh, if by chance you could post that link in the chat for us, where everyone would have I th it. I think Tony. I think Tony Renteria did post the link to the online version. Okay, um, good. In the chat. It is so, one of those. It, it is one of those things that the search bar on the Trek website is awesome <laughs> because that's where you find anything, Inspector. But if you go to the search bar. And you just type online SOP. It takes you right to that page. Save that page as a favorite on your phone, your pad, your computer. Uh, it's an accordion type style, I think they call it. You can click yeah. on a section. It drops. You see all that. You want to get that out of the way. You click on it. goes back up. You can scroll up and down. Uh, I think it's awesome. You can cut and paste off of it. Um, we are we are working on trying to make that a little bit more user friendly. I mean, that was something you know we're we're all sort of semi limited on what we can do uh, technologically in terms of not being IT. But one of the things we'd like to do is make it searchable. So we're working on that as well. It's not it's not searchable right now in the sense that when the accordions are all collapsed, you can't search it. Once it's open, you can search for a word under that provision. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. Um, it, it was designed to be able to pull it up on your phone. I think, Steve, you could you said you could do that and it worked fine. Oh, yeah. It yeah. is scalable or what do they call it? Reactive. Or yeah, yeah, like yeah. That, where it goes on there. But when, in the compacted version, searching, I've never found a need to really search for anything because when it's all compressed, you're only two screens and you got the whole SOP. I right. mean, you just scroll down two screens. So you can see every possible place you could go to. And the assumption is you kind of know where you're headed, you know, walls, structure, plumbing, and you go right to it. So if you have a question, especially on new things, you know, guys still get confused. Oh, was the laundry list of 11 GFCI areas? I got a note, the absence of, or the 13 arc fault areas. Well, and I personally put in our reports, I, I, I make two sections in my comments area, items that actually are defects because something broke or items that are defects because life safety has raised the bar and the defect is the absence of these items. And that way people understand my house, my 1942 house didn't break because it doesn't have arc faults or GFCIs. That's a life safety item. And it's easier for a client to understand what's broken, what's not there, like buying an old car with no seat belts or something. You just know what it is, you know, what the defect is, you know, the defect of the panel in the closet or things like that. Okay, that's a, it's more of a like life safety access item. It didn't break, uh, but I, I think, and going back to the SOP, I think it's great. You can, uh, that's that's even easier than the little pocket. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Steve. Well, listen, everybody, I want to just say thank you for being a part of this 
webinar today. It's been outstanding. And this will be recorded if you, any of you guys are listening or online with us or any of you people that have been hosting this thing. Uh, it will be recorded and be on the Internet site that you can go in and download. Or if you can't get to it, let me know, and I'll, I'll certainly get you a copy. It takes about a week for them to get it all uploaded. But, again, I'd like to say thank each of you for being here. I'd like to give you all an opportunity to uh, go ahead and say some final words before we go ahead and end the webinar. So, Tony, uh, Renter, let's start with you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, just one last uh, comment uh, that I wanted to leave you with is uh, that uh, whenever you inspect a property, uh, you have to make sure you leave it in the same condition as you found it. Uh, keep in mind that some appliances can be a safety hazard. Uh, always check before you leave that you turn off all appliances. We have had instances where, you know, even good inspectors, experienced inspectors sometimes forget, but it could be a major safety issue if you leave the range on uh, and forget to turn it off or, you know, the heater, etc. So just a reminder, uh, make sure that you always leave the property in the same condition as you found it. But thank you again. Uh, I enjoyed being here. Thank you, Tony. Mike? Thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I don't have a lot to add. Uh, just, uh, you know, our website has a lot of resources. I think what Steve touched on, you know, use that search bar. We do have FAQs on top of the, on top of the uh, the new uh, online uh, SOP. Um, we, you know, there's an attorney that answers you know questions about the rules, um, and you can email in to enforcement at trek.texas.gov. I'll put the email address in the chat. Um, if we don't really know, if we don't know the answer, then we'll reach out to our you know, subject matter experts, which are you know, members of the ins inspector committee as well. So, right, and you also, if you have any you know stuff, even though we just finished SOP review, if you see if you see items that they need looking at in the future, the inspector committee. Not that I'm speaking for them. I was always looking for for uh, involvement from the inspector community as well, so. All right, Tony? Uh, yeah, I just wanna reiterate something I said a couple of times uh, today. Well, three things. One is uh, to say what exactly what Mike said, get involved, be involved. That helps us make policy. You guys are on the front line. You see what's going on out there. If there are issues, we need to know about it um, in terms of whether it's correcting the SOPs or clarifying some things for you guys so you have a better understanding of what's expected. Um, also, I just want to reiterate, be transparent with your client. I think that is vitally important. I think you will find that uh, the more information you provide them up front, the less likely you're going to get in trouble in the back end of things. So that's, that's a big one. And then finally, not to open up a big can of worms, but I just want to stress, in the, in the um, when you're doing an inspection, if you're doing something and it fails, that's what you're there to report. So don't, don't feel like there's things that you can't do because, oh, they always break. Well, if they always break, there's an issue there and you should be, that's part of the inspection, you should be doing it. So don't, you know, it, I hear a lot of times inspectors will say, oh, I don't do this because it costs me money to get it fixed. Well, if it breaks in the process of doing the inspection, you're doing the client a service. I'm not sure why the repairs are on you, but I, that's something we can talk about at a much later date. Again, I didn't want to open up a big can of worms, but just to stress that as well. So thank you guys again. I, Paul, I really appreciate this. This is something that I think is going to benefit um, things going down the road, just this open communication between the agency and the, and the industry. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Tony. Stephen? Um, I think a lot of those are good ideas. I, I do challenge inspectors, especially uh, more senior inspectors who have seen multiple iterations of the SOP and changing. Uh, and that's where I find a, a lot of the issues, not the new inspectors that maybe broke their tooth on all these new SOPs in the last few months. It's the guys like me that are over 20 years. I've seen it a few times. Look through these SOPs. Don't just like, yeah, I know they changed some things, but I'm not sure what they are. But take take some time one evening and just look through each one of them and challenge you to 
find the things that are different, the things you don't remember that, oh, we got to do that. Uh, and you don't have to do that. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of assumed standards that are not in the SOP. Well, that's the way we've always done it. Up until this iteration, PS, you know, water pressure over 80 is not in the SOP. It is now. And there's a lot of other examples like that where people think it's in the SOP. They put it in every report and somebody says, why are you doing that? Well, sometimes the answer should be, well, I, my standard is higher than the SOP. Sometimes they use the SOP and it's not in there. So learn the SOP. It's not that hard to go through it. Uh, you know, if, if you have the little one or you print it, just go through and highlight all the things that you are not, you know, you don't remember doing. Because once you do that once, you probably remember it. But do that, like you say, leave the house the way it was. Uh, there's all kinds of examples. I've twice left ovens on in the last 20 plus years. And usually you think about it at two in the morning, you sit up and it's like, wow, I don't remember turning that off. Uh, or the next inspection, where's my oven gauge? Uh-oh, where'd I use it last? But, you know, have, have a system of checking yourself on the way out. You know, I have a little checklist. All my tools are in my bag. All the lights are back off. Lines are back down where they were. AC, I take a picture of the thermostat. So I put it back where it was. And like you said, leave the house where it was. It's usually the first thing a seller complains about is, you know, stuff's been rearranged or moved. If you can make it look like you were never there, perfect. Assume you're being videoed at every house. Yeah. You're being followed by a camera. I see cameras, doorbells. Uh, you're being videoed everywhere. Uh, just be professional. Do what you're there for. Again, don't be afraid to test something like, like Tony said, because I don't want to test that because they always break and they're going to make me fix it. Well, I have always been the theory that you discover the defect. You didn't create it. Every once in a while, it's possible, but you know, you discover the, the defect. The buyer will love you. The seller will not be sending you a Christmas card, but uh, it's a defect. And you stand, you know, try to stand your ground. It'll be a fight, and some of them you won't win. So, anyway, those are my ideas, a little philosophy. All right, good, Steve. Always good information. All right, folks, again, thank you so much for your time. I know everybody's busy, especially on a Monday morning. What a way to start off. Thank you guys so much for being with us. And uh, we look forward to doing another one of these sometime in the future. So take care. We'll end it. <laughs>